Something was moving out there. The sun beat down and the whole desert seemed to throb. The little girl screwed up her eyes. Five long-haired, ragged figures were striding towards her. She cried out in fear and her mother rushed out to see. It's the Sons of Light, she whispered and dropped to her knees. The men were almost on them now. Lay your hands on us, holy fathers, she cried, and give us your blessing. But the men didn't give her as much as a glance. They strode straight past her, their eyes blazing, and disappeared into the distance. The villagers were clustered round Elizabeth's baby, petting him, making little baby noises. But he didn't look very sweet. He was red-faced, howling with anger, his little fists beating the air. Mary sat to one side, re-reading her letter. So, Joseph wanted her back again. She'd go home soon. John! shrieked a maiden aunt. You can't call the baby John. Call him Zachariah like his father. I'd really rather call him John, said Elizabeth. It's out of the question, said the eldest uncle. He must have his father's name. Then out of the desert strode the sons of light, gaunt, powerful, looking like nothing would stand in their way. Let the father decide, said one of them, and tossed the slate to Zachariah. There was a hush as the old man scribbled away. Then he held it high above his head. John, it said. I, I forbid it, spluttered the eldest uncle. Slowly, painfully, Zachariah spoke. His name shall be John, he said. Then he took the little child tenderly in his arms, and as the whole village looked on in amazement, he handed him to the Sons of Light. Take him to your monastery, he said. He is a special child. I have dreamt he will prepare the way for the Great One who is about to appear. Immediately, little John stopped crying. Then the Sons of Light turned and looked at Mary, and their stare pierced her to the heart. Then off they went, with the little child, back into the desert. The foul-smelling green liquid trickled into the empty bottle. Salome popped the elegant stopper on the top, smiled, and handed it to her favorite slave girl. This should fix Antipater, she said. Do exactly as I say, my dear, and I promise you'll never have to work again. The slave girl silently left the room. Salome waited patiently. The clock ticked. An hour went by. In the stateroom, King Herod was in floods of tears as he clutched the body of his dead brother, Ferreras. How did this terrible thing happen? He cried. His courtiers hadn't got the faintest idea. One minute Ferreras had been as right as rain, and the next, boof, he was as dead as a doornail. The butler stood discreetly by the sweet trolley. Uh, perhaps he had a heart attack, he suggested. Then why is his mouth all green, demanded Salome. I believe he was sucking a lime-flavoured sweet when he died, explained the butler. You're lying, his Salome. Take him to the torture chamber. In the foul depths of the torture chamber, the torturers heated their instruments and discussed the sports results. Herod and Salome watched their work, nibbling at small pieces of smoked salmon. They were almost disappointed when the butler started to talk. Please, don't hurt me anymore, he screamed. It was Antipater's idea. He's planning to assassinate you, Your Majesty, and Ferreras knew, so Ferreras had to be silenced. Antipater, exploded Herod. My darling son, don't be ridiculous, he loves me. Anyway, he's in Rome added Salome. I know, mistress, said the butler, but your slave girl's in league with him. She does all his dirty work. She said she'd give up her life of crime if I helped her, and I love her so much. Salome grabbed her slave girl by the hair, flung her to the floor, and prized open her fingers. In her hand was a small green phial of liquid. Who gave you this, hissed Salome. Antipater.
whispered the slave girl. Herod let out a cry like an old lonely dog. Execute her, ordered Salome. Execute her at once. The slave girl looked up in astonishment. But my lady, she said, you promised. Her words were silenced by the blow of an ax. Yes, said Salome under her breath. I promised you'd never have to work again. And I never break my word, do I? To Antipater! In Rome, the Emperor Augustus was toasting his honoured guest. Antipater was in heaven. What a fantastic party. What brilliant food. He'd have to make himself sick soon to make room for some more. The Emperor leant back and whispered, I'm not happy. I know your father has been successful in dealing with the fanatics and religious maniacs with which your irritating little country is riddled, but it's getting very expensive to police. Don't worry, your majesty, said Antipater. Your coffers will be overflowing again soon. I will send word that a new tax must be introduced with every penny going to you. And why should you do that for me? Asked the emperor suspiciously. Because I am your loyal servant, and because when my father passes away, and let us pray that it is many years before he does, I hope you won't object if I am reluctantly forced to take the crown myself. And as he tilted his head and nibbled at a piece of asparagus, he looked even more like a stick insect than usual. Mary was home again. Joseph held her tight and felt the warm, round lump in her stomach that would soon be the baby. Their baby. Everything was going to be all right now. Bam! A boot kicked the door in, and there stood a brutish-looking Roman soldier. Still here, he demanded. You trying to dodge the register? What's he on about, said Mary. It's the Emperor's new tax, explained Joseph. We're supposed to go down to Bethlehem and give them all our details and stuff. But that means crossing the desert again. I know, love. I've only just got back. I'm exhausted. I know. I can't, Joseph. I could lose the baby. You'll lose it if you don't go, sweetheart, growled the Roman. I'll lose it for you. And he grabbed Joseph by the throat and flung him against the wall. I think you'd better start packing, sunshine. Antipater sailed back from Rome in triumph. The emperor was his good friend and provided Ferraras had got rid of Herod, and Tipita would be king of the Jews in a few hours. As the boat approached the harbour, he waited for the crowds to start cheering. That was one of the nice things about being a royal. The crowds cheered no matter what you did to them. Except this time, there was silence. He raced up the steps and onto the quay. Where was everyone? Where was the red carpet? A solitary messenger appeared out of nowhere. The king wants to see you straight away, he said. Antipater felt a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. If his father was still alive, what had happened to the assassination plan? 500 miles away, a tousle-haired professor was leaping through his university shouting, I've done it! I've worked it out! Students left their parties and ran after him. Teachers jumped out of bed and joined the throng. Soon the whole place was jam-packed full of excited scholars. It was a hush. Then the professor flung down a map covered in a thousand complicated calculations. The whole university poured over it, checked it, rechecked it, then finally... Yes, that's it, they shouted. You must leave straight away. And the professor and his two brightest research students mounted their camels and galloped off into the distance. A huge demonstration had taken over the whole of Nazareth. Smash the tax, the crowd chanted. Can't pay, won't pay. Then the Roman army moved in, thumping the demonstrators with clubs, lashing out with their boots. Stones were thrown, scuffles started. Mary was shoved this way and that. And where was Joseph? She couldn't find him anywhere. She slipped to the ground. A beery Roman loomed over her with a horrible grin on his face. He reached out to touch her cheek. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, an arm was round her and she was whisked into a tiny side street. It was Joseph, pleased as punch. I thought I'd lost you, gasped Mary. Then she burst into peals of laughter. 
What is that thing, she said. What's it look like, replied Joseph. It's a donkey. I know it's pretty clapped out, but at least it'll get you to Bethlehem. Come on, hop up. Antipater swallowed hard and opened the door to the throne room. Was he about to die? My son, I've missed you so much, gushed Herod. And he leapt to his feet, flung his arms round Antipater and covered his cheeks with wet kisses. Behind the throne stood Salome. Discreetly, she winked at Antipater. Antipater winked back and breathed a sigh of relief. So, everything was okay. Your enemies say you hate me, the king went on. They say you want to kill me. Father, who are these traitors? Let them be executed immediately, said Antipater in a shocked voice. It will be done, my darling son, all in good time. But hey ho, affairs of state, I have a meeting to attend. Go and have a bath. Purify yourself, my sweetheart. Wash away the filth while I exchange pleasantries with this foreign delegation. And he kissed him full on the lips. Antipater laughed out loud as he unbuckled his tunic. So, he was still alive. Still the apple of his darling daddy's eye. Ferraras may have bungled the assassination. But there'd be plenty more chances. He unbuckled his sword, unstrapped the dagger from under his arm and the stiletto from his leg, and waded into the pool. How nice to be home. There was a polite cough. He looked up. The pool was surrounded by Herod's bodyguards with their swords drawn. The king says you want all traitors executed immediately, said the captain of the guard. So you'd better come along with me, hadn't you? Herod was feeling irritated. His son was a traitor, his scabs itched, and these foreign university professors were driving him mad with their chatter. And then, Your Majesty, they were saying, our astronomers discovered a major new star never before identified, and that clinched it for us. That, coupled with our research into biblical prophecy, has proved beyond a shadow of doubt that an event of major significance is about to take place. A very important person is about to ascend onto the world stage. So what? thought Herod. A new king is going to be born right here in your territory. Isn't that exciting? Suddenly, Herod forgot his itching. A new king, he said, here in my kingdom. How wonderful, how wonderfully wonderful. Tell me, where exactly will this take place? And he forced his lips into the friendliest of friendly smiles.